begin uh, by talking about these works of uh, going to be uh, a very hard uh, act to follow, but in many ways uh, a wonderful context and uh, a wonderful uh, opportunity for me uh, to say something. Uh, because um, these works really come out of the older system of knowledge, system of belief, and art practice. And I think we heard from Boyle and Yinomar the extent to which art in Northeast Ireland is a way of communicating both to the world outside, but also with the spiritual universe that underlies that world. And um, these paintings, although Will said, I don't know really where Point B comes from, I can't really explain uh, this art or where it comes from in a sense as a kind of anthropologist art historian. Um, my job is partly that. And uh, it's very interesting. I've worked in uh, Northeast Ireland for many, many years and uh, um, with uh, Jamal Mar Mar Marawali. And uh, when I was looking at an aspect of a painting on one occasion, and I asked Jamal a question, um, and it was got to do with something about how, if you look at a painting like this wonderful uh, image here of the ancestral snake at Baralcha, you can actually see the snake emerging and then going in to the background that surrounds it. So it's this sense of what I, as an academic, call emergent figuration and so on and so forth. So I was uh, taking a detailed photograph of the head of the snake in a similar kind of painting, and Jabba said, that's you, that's the anthropologist trying to find out and work out how it's made. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, how this is made is because it comes out of uh, a, a, a fantastically developed, relatively autonomous tradition of aesthetic practice, of technical accomplishment, of uh, 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 knowledge of how to produce images uh, that once learnt can be applied to all sorts of different contexts and media. So uh, underlying a lot of these paintings we can see the cross hatching that has been done for years, generations, uh, made from brushes, thin human hair that create this surface effect. At the same time if you're looking at uh, you'll know uh, carvings and wooden work, if you're looking at work produced for all sorts of different kind of contexts, you have a history of people incising into woods, in creating depth uh, through that particular practice. And what you see here is a combination of those particular techniques. You're getting things that actually um, cross-cut boundaries between uh, you know, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, almost four-dimensional art, uh, and um, using these techniques to actually see potential in raw materials. Um, so as Will pointed out, we have here uh, this uh, found uh, material, uh, this found medium uh, that uh, most people are wandering around that it's the sort of discarded leftovers of people who were uh, putting insulation in a roof. Um, but uh, Boynby was able to see this and using in a sense, the only system of aesthetics to see the potential in that material, both by sizing into it, uh, by revealing beneath the surface silver uh, the uh, uh, textures uh, underneath, and then applying uh, pigment uh, to the surface. So that what you create here is something that captures a Yolngu um, concept, a Yolngu aesthetic concept of Uryu which um, can be translated really as shimmering brilliance. It's the uh, uh, light that shines out of these paintings, but it's the light that people imagine in the ancestral dimension of the world that is then being, uh, if you like, created, reproduced through art. So there's a kind of dual relationship between the ancestral world and the people who are bringing it forward uh, in time. So one of the things that you're uh, seeing in these works here, even though these are works of extraordinary innovation, is something in terms of an aesthetic practice, a desire to create something uh, that has been there in 
his father's time, in his grandfather's time, in his great grandfather's time, and he imagined to be there in the country. And I don't know if you saw that what um, Yirmala uh, was saying at Boinby, that the snake itself, as this ancestral presence in land, is actually something that is part of those paintings, that is in a way something that both re is represented by the paintings, but sees the paintings, creates the paintings, absorbs the paintings, and then standing up in the river mouth of Baralcha, spitting into the sky, sends the essence of those paintings to communicate uh, to other uh, people. So we can see here works that come out of a Yolnu system of knowledge uh, that uh, people have been deeply trained in, yet at the same time, people who are also engaged with very other kinds of worlds and technologies. And I think it was so important that Boyd be uh, uh, and, and will you know, contextualize his past as someone who was a fantastic person uh, working, building houses in the homelands. And um, Will uh, indirectly was referring to kind of one of the sort of difficulties that Yongo have had in this context because um, getting the resources to build the houses in the homelands is not an easy thing to do. Will was referring to the eight houses in Yongan. This is the community where all these artists come from. If you'd have gone to Yongan 15 years ago, you'd have actually found those same eight houses. There is one new house there in this period of time. But this is in a community in remote Australia that is a community of extraordinary uh, vitality, vibrancy, determination to exist there and exist in many ways through making this major cultural contribution um, to uh, Australia as a whole. Uh, I mean, you've had such a wonderful presentation by the artists here that I don't need to say any more about um, these words. I'm happy to answer a few questions at the moment and then I might say something about a couple of the other artists' works that I um, have uh, written about in the catalogue. Does uh, anyone have any questions that they would like to finish? Uh, there's the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, how did the houses that have been built there, are they similar to the ones in the Western Desert, for instance, that are built on art stations? No, the houses. Um, uh, look, it's really uh, a complicated history of house building. These were built really quite some time ago by the Glenapoi Association uh, under specifications that were developed uh, by the community and working uh, with indigenous workers. Uh, subsequently, Francis can really tell these things more than me, in recent years there have been sort of higher specifications introduced for the buildings of houses, I think. But those houses on the whole have not been built. So I mean, one of the things that people talk about uh, in terms of the sort of project to build many mm -hmm. houses in uh, Arnhem Land and Northern Australia is that those houses actually are not being built. And I think the specifications require them almost to be built by outside contractors. And each house is so incredibly expensive. So they were a different <coughs> kind of house. They were a kind of practical house designed for context. Is that vaguely right, what I said? Okay, then. Um, now, well, what, what I might um, do is say a little bit about uh, the works of uh, Jan Millikan here. Um, Jan is now, I think, probably in her 90s uh, and was unable to come. She is the uh, person who has won the uh, Western Australian uh, Prize here. And these uh, works are works, as you can see, of luminous. Uh, uh, it comes from a movement at Wichindega that uh, started probably about eight years, nine years ago uh, in association with the Short Street Gallery when the artist section came to approach the gallery and said we would really like to start painting there. And Emily Raw, as a kind of arts advisor at a distance, uh, has strongly encouraged the sort of development of the art movement here. And uh, clearly, uh, like uh, many um, artists from uh, the Western Desert, uh, people suddenly say, oh, it's extraordinary. Here is this old lady in Haiti starting painting for the first time. Well, of course, that's exactly what you have to get out of your minds 
um, you know, these are communities of people who, just like the people in North East London, have been painting, have been singing, have been uh, uh, established artists in their uh, uh, country and in their own way uh, for uh, much of their lives. And in a sense, that is how, when acrylics and canvas are introduced, <laughs> people are able to suddenly, amazingly, produce extraordinary works. It's, it's because, in fact, they come from uh, traditions of art practice. And if you look at the works that uh, Jan Dillingham has uh, painted over uh, the period since she's been an acrylic uh, painting artist, uh, you can actually see very interesting uh, changes uh, in the style of work uh, as she uh, began to get to understand the nature of the meaning, medium and its potentialities. Uh, the first paintings that were produced by Jan and many of the other artists associated with Virginia Dega uh, were in fact uh, works that were much more uh, minimalistic in their uh, structures were uh, paintings that were uh, uh, paintings that had been, uh, say, body paintings that included uh, 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 repetition of a whole series of uh, design motifs, and then uh, paintings also that represented um, the uh, trans tra uh, uh, travels of uh, ancestral means across uh, the desert route. And then what she's done is she's focused her paintings on particular places associated with her, um, if you like, spiritual uh, ancestry, and has started to paint these canvases as a whole that in many ways evoke um, the uh, desert landscape of her country in the state of its kind of transformation seasonally and uh, from place to place. But uh, it's um, uh, some, although I can answer many questions in the case of Greenpeace Art here, I'm really not in a position to ask, uh, answer detailed questions about Jen uh, Billikans. But I am very much, as we all are, able to, uh, in a sense, appreciate the extraordinary uh, way uh, that she uh, creates these images which both glow but have this incredible kind of depth. And one of the characteristics of, uh, in, uh, of Indigenous Australian art is the way in which depth is created uh, through the practice of artwork. So that although you have this tremendous luminosity, you're always able to enter into paintings, to go to a level of depth. And that's one of the things that um, these paintings have very much in common with Ancalia's paintings on the wall there, which are the last ones that I'll probably um, talk about now. Yeah, uh, all of these works uh, is in fact on uh, Page Hill, which is a site associated with the uh, uh, Seven uh, Sisters uh, dreaming. And I was actually very uh, fortunate yesterday, although uh, I have um, always, for a long time, uh, admired uh, Ankelia's uh, work, I didn't meet the artist until yesterday. And I read some things in the catalogue that were kind of intuitions from um, uh, looking at the works in a great detail. And uh, then I was able to walk through with Ankelia, and um, fortunately, most of my intuitions were confirmed. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, I'd have probably uh, been living in shame from uh, now on. Uh, Ankelia uh, has, as you can see, an extraordinary sense of sort of color. So if you look at each of these works in turn, uh, you'll find that each of them seems to uh, be uh, very harmonious in the sense of uh, color that she's used. Um, tremendous contrast between uh, this particular image here and the ones at the end where you're moving from this uh, sort of you know, brilliance of the oranges and reds uh, when you go down to a kind of very calming blue. This is my subjective judgments going in into how I feel about these. And she's also developed this extraordinary uh, figurative style, um, which is very much uh, her own. Uh, I talk about it in terms of uh, in the case of the sort of lizards, which you see that look sort of larger than uh, life, beautiful and plump, uh, that in fact it is uh, a representation of how you would like uh, the uh, food animals in the desert to be. Uh, plump, fat, uh, uh, delicious, 
uh, and that is it, and the same with the sort of witchy grabs and things like that, and that is very much uh, how uh, she is uh, painting uh, these. You've also got the introduced uh, animals, the sheep, because Ankalia uh, uh, began actually as an artist in Annabella, uh, a Presbyterian uh, mission uh, station, uh, and one that has had the oldest established art centre in uh, Central Australia, a long history of art practice uh, that began uh, with um, the uh, painting uh, or, or the, these beautiful sort of pastel drawings that people are probably familiar with early on from Annabella and then developed into one where wonderful uh, carpets were made out of the wool uh, that was locally uh, grown in sheep and so on and so forth. So uh, Ankalia came from uh, a history of that uh, area of art practice and producing things uh, for a market context. Uh, but then uh, in uh, the last uh, uh, decade or more, uh, she's been living in a fairly remote uh, outstation uh, community on the uh, South Australian, Western Australian Territory border that area. Um, but what you can see uh, is a, a, almost a unique style of painting. Uh, not only does it combine uh, the uh, figurative with the geometric elements. Uh, it includes also uh, these overall kind of almost colour fields uh, which refer to characteristics of the uh, colours of the uh, landscape. Uh, but you can also see if you start looking at it in detail, she employs very different kind of techniques of representation. Uh, here um, we can see uh, what something that looks like uh, really beautiful fluid brush strokes uh, but the way she does this is by uh, putting pigment on the end of a stick and moving it. Uh, so nearly all of the painting that she does is actually not using brushes but using uh, sticks which she then moves the paint around in. But she also, in some of these, uh, in this one here, but in fact all of them, you'll suddenly see that she's actually carving into the paint uh, once she's finished the surface. So uh, this is a very good example here where you've got the uh, uh, fluent uh, use of the stick to produce this beautiful colour effect and then she's covered whole areas in pigment and then carved into uh, the pigment itself. So you really see that the technique that she's developing here uh, is one that is in many ways sort of getting very involved with the paint, moving it across the canvas and when she talks about the words she actually goes down almost at this point in time. So you can actually see her painting at a level of, uh, if you like, sort of detail that is almost like the level of engagement that she has with the country and with the land. And at the same time as she's doing this detail, she must have in her imagination the way that these paintings are going to be integrated as a whole. And one of the extraordinary things, in fact, about much indigenous Australian art and I suspect this is actually a capacity of artists trained everywhere, is the ability to create things according to different scales. So you'll see um, that uh, works in this exhibition here uh, uh, vary uh, from sort of relatively small scale to really magnificent large scale, and the capacity to move scale is quite extraordinary. If you look at some of the other galleries here, they have one of the great uh, Ewan de Moo collaborative uh, paintings on display here, where you have something like 20 or 30 artists, some of them senior artists, others just trainees, more or less, uh, working on a canvas as a whole, and somehow it turns out to be uh, integrated and beautiful as a work of art. But I think Ankalia is an exceptional painter, um, and um, when you um, look at, uh, say, this area here, um, and uh, uh, but she was uh, looking at that, and we've got the sort of, you know, the introduced the sheep uh, on the surface. Uh, but this area here, we've got the sort of worms that exist below the ground. We've got wichity grubs. Um, we have them eating uh, the uh, roots of uh, 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 dying or dead uh, trees. Uh, we have scatters of leaves across the surface. So these paintings are extremely dense with meaning. And every so often, she's actually included something that relates to the iconography of the ceremonial art that underlines uh, the surface form. So here we've got, 
in fact, a representation of aspects of the Seven Sisters uh, ancestral um, track. So uh, I'll probably uh, stop talking now. I'm happy to ask sort of general, answer general questions now if there are any. Um, but uh, I'll hand the microphone. Oh, I'll still. So I don't know if there are any. Yeah. I've got one. When you said sticks, is it just something she picked up off the ground, or she has a special collection? No, no. I'm sure that they'll they'll be, um, uh, yeah, cotton kind of sticks yeah. and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you. And uh, did the artist say anything about the black ground, sort of working with light paint on a dark background? Uh, she didn't say anything about that. I mean, the ground that. Uh, Ankalia puts um, on all her paintings and has done from the very beginning is this overall ground of red. So uh, her paintings have always been characterised by that particular ground there. And um, I'm not sure, uh, but I mean, the interesting thing about her works are that she creates her own sort of frame. So I think that what she's doing here is, and what you're seeing, is it's actually the red is, you know, the frame that she is creating on that black uh, ground. But, um, You'd have to ask her, and she probably will be here to talk. Oh, no, I think she'll be here later on today. Yes, yeah, later on today, yeah. Okay. Well, if there aren't any more questions.